Stanford University. How many of you are here because you're about to go out into the job market and you're scared to death and you would just like a job? Okay, oh, that's good to know. How many people know something about the energy and electricity industries already? Ooh, okay, that changes my, that changes the calculus. Um, and I guess the last one, anybody here considering going to law school? <laughs> good call, okay, <laughs> especially now. But anyway, all right, that helps me. Thank you very much for assisting with that. Um, my goals were more modest and frank. He was talking about saving the world. Um, well, I'm, I have not saved the world, and I don't hold myself as having done so, but I, I'd like to think that over the past 30-odd years, I've done some good while I've been okay. Um, the motto, motto of my career has been neither a nun nor a prostitute. Um, you know, I'm, and, and I think that is actually, in some ways, in the long run, you can get more good done that way by being out on either polar extreme because, you know, you might have a chance to kind of work your way through the middle. Um, graduating in times like these can be extremely intimidating. I put up here door number one versus door number two, and it seems like the choices are few. You can either you know, cast your lot in with the 1%, try to go to Wall Street or the you know, energy equivalent thereof, become a commodities trader, you know, become an energy trader, uh, make the big bucks, live the big lifestyle, or you can be out in Zuccotti Park um, with those people who are protesting that lifestyle. But I like to try and present the idea that there are a range of options in between those two polar extremes, and I've tried hard through my career to find those, which, by the way, I completely stumbled on. I'd like to say I did my research, I did figure out my options, and it's all so not true. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about my career path um, and how I got to where I got. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I work for um, and how we are different. Um, if you know anything about our nation's electric utilities, the ones that provide retail electric service, they come in three flavors. Um, the first are investor-owned utilities. Most of them are publicly traded. They serve about 75% of the market. But there's about 200 or so of them. And they have a difficult act because they have to satisfy their shareholders, both in terms of share price and quarterly dividend, while at the same time trying to provide utility service at the retail level. Um, and that's often not easy to do, create some split incentives. Then you have about 900 rural electric cooperatives. And they serve, interestingly enough, about 10% of the nation's customers and about 40% of the land mass. These are the people with a lot of dirt between the light bulbs, six customers per mile. That is not an economic proposition for providing electric service, which means they got their start through FDR and the Rural Electrification Administration, the REA. Um, and so they have been around since the 30s. They're a product of the New Deal. They are consumer owned because they are co-ops. So you are a customer of a rural electric co-op. You own a portion of the utility. You get what they call patronage dividends as an offset to your bill. And then there's us, public power systems. We are units of state and local government. So we are in the business of providing electric service, which is in some ways a proprietary function, but we are units of state and local government. And there's about 2,000 of us. And we range, we're in 49 states. We range from the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the big behemoth of our sector, down to you know, the town of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We have a lot more smaller members than we have larger members. But um, I have to serve the gamut, you know, the largest to the smallest in 49 different states. <clears throat> Public power systems and co-ops are not for profit. This is a huge difference. In other words, we are not trying to produce value for the shareholder. We're not trying to produce a quarterly profit. All we are trying to do is serve our customers, who are either our owners directly through the, the co-op methodology or indirectly through the medium of local government. Um, and so our job is to provide the best possible, most reliable service consistent with the lowest possible cost and good environmental stewardship. And good environmental stewardship is coming, becoming a bigger and bigger part of our mission over time. So we have no split incentives between the customers and the shareholders. And frankly, it makes our lives easier. I work with a lot of people at member systems who used to work for IOUs. And they, it's interesting how they've told me, it's so much easier here. You know, I'm not serving two masters, I'm only serving one master. Um, and now I will depart. 
from the script to talk about how I found out about public power systems and how I came to be in this industry. Uh, a textbook example of what you probably should not do, but it also shows that serendipity can work. Um, I graduated with my undergraduate degree in economics. Um, I was interviewing jobs for the linen department of Target. I realized I needed further education. I decided, well, I'll go to law school, and I'll go to law school in Washington where our nation's laws are made. Yeah, that's the ticket. So that's what I did. And I borrowed the money to go. I went to law school at the George Washington University. Uh, graduated in 1980, right when President Reagan came in, and all government jobs. You know, I had maybe an interest in working for the Federal Trade Commission. Forget about that. There were no jobs. But I had worked as a summer associate at a large corporate firm in DC to get money to finance my third year. Um, and they offered me a job, and I had to take it or leave it very quickly. Their job offers expired in December. So I took it, you know, because I didn't know what else to do. I was a deer in the headlights. I spent two years working at this firm. I represented uh, mining companies who were under potential indictment for explosions of methane in their mines. I worked in the AMC Jeep rollover cases. I worked, you know, you name it, I did it. And I just felt really bad when I went home at night. It was like, what am I doing? You know, and I was just a little cog. I was the fourth or fifth associate doing the legal research. You know? But when it came home to me is when I was, my legal research, as I was telling Frank earlier this afternoon, got our client off of an indictment, a criminal indictment for violations of the Mine Safety and Health Act. And I thought, boy, didn't I do great work today. You know? So I managed to stumble on the energy practice of this law firm. And they were representing investor-owned distribution companies who were actually attempting to keep rates low to consumers. And I thought, wow, how did this happen? You know, this is great. I think I can actually do this work. So I kind of burrowed into their energy practice, made myself indispensable, um, and then started looking around at the cases we were doing before a government agency called the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which I will get to in a minute. And um, I realized that, yeah, we were saying the right things, but we weren't exactly saying it with the requisite amount of passion. Um, and when I really figured this out was when the case that we were working on, trying to keep natural gas prices low, the chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission at that time gave a speech in which he called our docket a, quote, witch hunt, which in some people's minds would indicate some level of prejudgment that maybe he had a view about whether this case was worth anything or not. So we as a, as a group, all the litigants on the side of the case trying to keep gas prices low, decided to file a motion asking him to recuse himself from the case. That means that you won't consider it because you've prejudged the outcome. And I, as the associate, you know, three or four levels down, got the job of writing that pleading. And then I found out that our client would not file it. Why? because they didn't want to endanger their relationships. You know, they really were just all about trying to make it look back home at the state commission like they'd reduce their rates, but they weren't really willing to go that last mile and actually file this pleading. Instead, they said, you know, well, there's these consumer-owned, you know, the, 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 these uh, consumer-owned gas systems, let them file it. And so they did. And that started the wheels turning in my head thinking, why aren't I working for them? You know, I think I would have a better quality of life, even though I would have a lower salary, um, if I went to work for that law firm, which was a boutique firm of about five lawyers. And so when we started sending documents around to review, I started sticking my name on, on my card on the things we sent to the partner at this firm, just so he knew I existed in the bowels of the library at this large corporate firm. And sure enough, it, and within a year, I was working there. And I took the pay cut, but I figured it, if you're not going to take it early in your career, you, you won't be able to take it later. So, so I took it, I started working for cooperatives and public gas systems, and that started me on my long career. And I have to say, I have not regretted it at all. Because I feel that you know, I don't make it as the, as the kind of salaries I would have made had I stayed at that firm or had I represent invested owned utilities, but I really feel like I've tried to do some good in my advocacy work, and I feel like I've kind of made a difference, at least around the margins. We'll get to the wonderful life theory of regulation in a little while. But the fact of the matter is, I feel like I have made a difference around the edges, at least. I've had a good career. I've made very good money by any national standard. Inside the Beltway, it's nothing. 
but you know, outside the Beltway, I've done really well. So that's my little kind of departure from the PowerPoints to tell you how I found this segment of the industry and how you can too, if you just keep your eyes open and look around you, you know, in whatever field you go into, just try and find those sweet spots because they do exist, you just have to look for them. Now back to my PowerPoints. Um, I wanted to try and give an example of how the public power difference can kind of work out. Um, how many of you are familiar with the smart meter installation that was done with Pacific Gas and Electric? Yeah, as you know, that didn't go so hot. Um, there were some issues there. Um, and I'm not faulting Pacific Gas and Electric. I am not you know, stay, saying anything pro or con about their method of proceeding. But the fact of the matter is that their customers, I think, immediately assumed, you guys are out to get us. You know, you're trying to increase our rates to increase your profits. Whether that was true or not, that is kind of the perception that you often have with investor-owned utilities. Now look at the Sacramento Municipal Utilities District, embedded in the PG&E service territory, also going to do a smart grid installation, got a big grant from the federal government to do that, this, one of the smart grid grants. And they had to kind of step back and say, how can we introduce this to customers in a way where they know we come in peace? You know, we're here to try and help you manage. We're here to try and give you more information about your electricity bill. We're here to assist you. This smart meter installation is just not all about us pumping up our rate base. It really is about trying to provide you better service. We find, you know, and I'm not saying we, it works well in all cases. A rate increase is a rate increase and people hate them no matter who's doing them. That's just a fact. But the fact of the matter is we come at it with a little bit more credibility and we come at it from a different angle because they can't automatically say you're just in it for the money because we're not in it for the money. That's the last thing we're in it for. We're not for profit. So that's my example. I talked about my career path. So we're moving on. Um, and eventually I was recruited by the American Public Power Association. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Um, they invited me to become both their general counsel and their senior Vice President of Policy Analysis, this is an example of hire the woman, give her two titles, give her one salary, make her work twice as hard. And it worked, you know? <laughs> um, because this trade association is composed of units of state and local government, we do not have a lot of money. You can imagine the dues, you know, come out of our customers' rates. So they have to be very, very carefully spent. We don't have a lot of staff. We kind of, again, it's an example of trying to, I, it's, to not do, I would say guerrilla law is probably a little strong. But you know, we have to do a lot with a lot less than our neighbor, um, the investor-owned uh, trade association is called the Edison Electric Institute, which we used to nickname the Evil Empire Inc. But actually, we've been working with them on a lot of issues. And my, I love my friends over at Edison Electric Institute. But the fact of the matter is we're a lot smaller, and we have to do a lot more with a lot less. So I do all sorts of stuff. And it's actually a very fun job if you're thinking of ever going in that direction. Um, I, work, I practice before the FERC. I've had to become an expert in the Dodd-Frank Act. My new friends over at the CFTC. Um, we've done some work at the SEC, uh, FCC, poll attachments. Now there's a variety of federal agencies um, that we get involved with. Um, and I also have to review legislation for my lobbyist friends down the hall. Um, and that is, you know, I spent Friday reviewing cybersecurity legislation. Isn't that, you know, a fun and interesting subject? But again, if something happens, it's going to be really bad for everybody. So it's important. It's a very important area. Um, and I am not a registered lobbyist, but I am what we call a hobbyist. I have to keep track of my time, and I get dragged down to meetings with congressional staff when they need, quote, gravitas, you know, which means gray hair. Um, anyway, so... Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the regulation of electricity and some of the core issues that um, I have to spend my time on. As I said, there's a, an independent agency called the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and that regulates part of our industry. Part of our industry's problem is we have dual regulation. At the federal level, for wholesale sales and interstate transmission, we have the FERC. At the retail level, for distribution and retail sales, we have the, the investor owns generally have the state public utility commissions. Now, my segment of the industry, we're not regulated in general by FERC, although we are for certain specific functions. And at the local level, we are generally self-regulated. It's our own utility board, our own city council sets our rates. Um, so we're kind of in a different mode than the rest of the industry. 
And there are three basic components of our industry, and those of you who are familiar with this, you can just take a two-minute nap. Um, we have elect the generation sector. Pub you know, we have all types of generation, you know, nuclear, coal, wind, solar, geothermal, biomass from landfills. And, and more recently, we are starting to regard energy efficiency and demand response, in other words, the decision not to consume in any particular hour, as a resource as well. That can be part of our uh, portfolio to serve load. Then there is the transmission, the higher voltage transmission facilities you see often near interstate you know, highways. In the west, there's um, a major facility system that comes down from the Pacific Northwest. There's the you know, California Oregon border station. There's all these major transmission lines coming down to California. And then there's the lower voltage distribution. You can liken that to the interstate highway for transmission and then you know, service roads and residential roads for distribution. So those are, th those are the three components that get power from the point of generation to your meter. Traditionally, in the olden times, um, one utility did all three of those functions. They own the generation, they own the transmission, they moved their power over their lines to their customers, and it was all what they call bundled or wearing blender service. But starting in the mid-1990s, there was a movement to deregulate. I put that in quotes because it's really a misnomer. There's a whole lot of regulation still, it's just less effective. Um, but, but at any rate, they started the move to deregulate electricity at the retail level, and it started right here in California. The, I, I think was it Pete Wilson, um, yes. professor? Yes, Pete Wilson decided that the electricity rates in California were high, it was driving out industry, we should inject competition into our industry to lower rates and improve service. And so what they did is they unbundled, they did what they call retail access, where you as a customer, residential, industrial, or, com or commercial, could choose your power supplier. And uh, that power would be delivered to you over the wires, the transmission and distribution wires of the local utility, the you know, SoCal Ed, Edison, PG&E, but you would have a choice of power suppliers. Um, and in order to make that possible and to level the playing field, the utilities sold off their generation to third parties. And this happened a lot in the East as well as in the West. Sometimes it was sold to totally independent generators. Sometimes it was sold to an unregulated affiliate of the electric utility, which in my view is the worst of all possible worlds, but that happened in a lot of cases. Um, and I should note that among the leading companies pushing for these changes in many states were our friends at Enron. They really thought this was a great opportunity to make money. Um, I read one of the many books that was written on the Enron crack up and what was I, a little detail I found fascinating was that electric, you know, the retail access for residential customers, you've got to think about it, to go out to get a residential customer to buy your power, there's a lot of marketing costs there, a lot of education costs, a lot of transaction costs. And so Jeff Skilling's guys were told to go off and write the business case for this and they came back and said, we can't make it work. You know, the amount of money that you have to spend to get the customer is really more than you'll get from the customer. And he's like, don't believe it, go back, redo the numbers. And they came back and they said, we, no, really, we can't, we just, it doesn't seem to work. And he's like, well, you know, you're wrong. And pushed ahead with it anyway, which I found fascinating because I honestly feel like unless you have some type of aggregation function to aggregate these retail customers into groups, it's very, very difficult to do this customer by customer. And there are some customers who are interested in spending their, their you know, uh, leisure hours in comparing electricity deals, but there's a whole lot of us who would actually like, prefer to watch TV or work out or eat dinner or you know, a lot of other stuff. So I think the amount of interest in it might have been overestimated as well. But as I said, the IOUs generation was sold off and we created wholesale markets. The one in California is called the Power Exchange, yes, sir. Uh, why did it seem to work in telephony, but not in electricity? I spend more on my electric bill than I do in my phone bill. Well. How could they make it work for telephones? In the long run, did it really work for telephones? <laughs> I mean, I well, look at my forward. Verizon bill, I'm not so sure it did, but the fact of the matter there was that they were able to market they had like two or three suppliers. They were, MCI was able to get access to the wires. It worked for a short time, but then the industry reintegrated. 
Um, and you have very substantial monopoly power in that industry now. Still have choices in my long distance, for example. Yes, you do. You do have choices, and you've got your your Verizon FiOS bundle, and you've got you know. But I don't know if you've necessarily lowered your rates in the end. And when we get to Q and A, I'll ask Mr. Doctor Doctor Wallach to comment on that. Um, but I'm just telling you, this is what you know. Enron went off and ran the numbers, and their guys couldn't make them work. Um, so we, what we ended up with were the generation plants were sold off, and then they constructed in California a market called the Power Exchange, the, the PX, and all the power was being sold into the PX, um, and the utilities were buying out of the PX. Um, so, um, and a lot of this happened in the East. About 30 states did retail access, and um, interestingly enough, going to your point, in most states, there is what they call default service. And um, the very substantial majority, at least of residential customers, it's a different story for commercial and industrial, but the vast majority of residential customers have stuck with default service from their incumbent um, and have not taken advantage of the opportunity to shop. Now, had they been forced to do what they did in Texas is they forced everyone on the market, said you can't stay with your incumbent. You must go out and and purchase from a third party. And so people did it. But given the choice, inertia is a very substantial factor, especially if the default rate is a, you know, a rate that doesn't knock your eyeballs out. Um, so we had the transmission turned over to these, uh, what they call eventually ISOs or RTOs, retail transmission organizations. Um, and the power, the wholesale prices were deregulated, subject to market monitoring in each RTO. And um, again, Dr. Wallet knows a lot about that. He was an outside market monitor in California. So let me stop here and say that when this was all going on, most of those state statutes made retail access and unbundling optional for public power systems and for cooperatives. The theory being, since those were locally owned utilities, not for profit, and owned by their customers, they should make the decision themselves as to whether they would open up their systems to retail access. A few did, not very many. Um, interestingly enough, I think Delaware Electric Co-op comes to mind. Nobody came in to provide service besides Delaware Electric Co-op. Um, and in most cases, we decided we're not doing it because we have already aggregated the buying group to go out and participate in the wholesale market. We have that, and we're not for profit. So we are not going to do a markup as any other supplier who came in would likely do. So, and and I'm, I'm a believer in this model. I think that their economies of scale and vertical integration actually do have some benefits for customers, especially when provided on a not-for-profit basis. But that's just where I came from based on my um, 30 years in the industry. But then in California, those of you, you know, many of you were probably still in junior high, but things went to hell in a handbasket in 2000 and exposed some of the shortcomings of that new model. I'm not going there just to say that, but it did show the susceptibility of these markets to, um, to manipulation in the absence of adequate regulation. However, in these states where the generation had been sold off and it had been unbundled, it was too late to go back. So that's the model that we have. Um, and the real issue, I think, is how do we make, in those states that have that model, how do we make it work? And that is, I'll talk a little bit about that now. My members, because we buy power in the wholesale market, especially in the eastern markets, began to realize early, around 2004, that this was not working out as advertised. There were not that many new entrants coming into the market. There were not that many more choices. There was not lower prices. Um, in fact, prices were starting to go up. And what we found was that they were very, very unwilling to enter into longer term agreements, which we would consider five to 20 years. It was more like one or two year, three year agreements. And even then, it was set at the prevailing price in the market. In other words, what could we get as a seller in the RTOs it's a power supply market, and then we'll do a forward price curve based on, based on that. Well, if that's the case, we could just buy from the market. You know, how are we being bettered by this system? So, um, and this all happened right when I first came to APPA. Within a week, I was plunged into this, like, oh my gosh, these people are unhappy. We, I thought restructuring was going to work, but it didn't. So we started the Electric Market Reform Initiative, the EMRI, to, and we hired a lot of consultants to study different aspects of these markets, and then we recommended some changes to these markets to try and make them more balanced between 
asset owners and consumers. I've put our website address in there if you're really interested in this. If you go to our website and you look on the main page for EMRI, Electric Market Reform Initiative, then that'll take you to the section of our website that has all the studies and all the work we've done over the years. What's happened is, is that RTOs and ISOs now run a variety of centralized power markets, which they call organized markets, okay? Implying that any bilateral market is a disorganized market, which is one of those semantic terms that drives me crazy because if you think about classic e economics, what does a buyer take, what a market needs? Many buyers, many sellers, full information. What we have here is a centralized market with a, a limited number of sellers and actually limited information as well, um, which is a different story. But um, so these markets, these organized markets, I call them centralized markets because they're run by the RTO, um, have a variety of different pro of products, all of which were split out of what used to be the bundled product. And each one, of course, has its own market rules and its own auctions and its own cost. As I said, there's a limited number of generators participating in these markets. Um, you have repeated auctions. You have locational pricing. So different parts of the system have different pricing depending on whether it's constrained. And a single clearing price. And when you add up all of this, um, it is my strong suspicion, and I think our Emory studies have shown, that prices to consumers are higher than they might otherwise be. We have done work with the 10Ks and annual reports of the like five or six largest sellers into the PJM market and show that their rates of return for sales into the market are well over 20%, which is really nice work if you can get it, um, but doesn't necessarily mean that consumers are getting the best value for their dollar. So we've actually proposed um, a, our own kind of set of modifications to these markets. It's called the Competitive Market Plan. Um, I brought one copy of it with me. Those of you who are true aficionados who can't wait to crack it, I will, you, know, you can compete for my one copy. It's also available on the website. Um, I'm the first to admit that we are fighting an uphill battle here because the incumbent generators in these markets that have these depreciated units, which they enter into, you know, they enter them into the auction and they get the single clearing price. So they are making a lot of money on the spread between their costs of these depreciated units and the, the single clearing price. So they have a lot of money. They have a lot of influence in the RTOs because these rules are set through stakeholder negotiations. And if you own the assets and participation in these uh, markets is, quote, voluntary and you can take your assets to another market, it kind of gives you a little bit more clout in setting these market rules than the poor consumers on the other side have. Um, and FERC is supposed to regulate these, but of course the RTOs are independent entities, and if these rules have come from a stakeholder process, who is FERC to overturn them? So you find that there's a lot of deference paid, and this system, frankly, is very stacked against consumers and their interests. So let me talk, I'm going to close by talking a little bit about um, the challenges that we're going to be facing and why bright brains like yours are so needed. Um, first of all, we're hopefully coming out of the recession at long last. And if that's going to happen, then demand is going to start to increase, demand for electricity. And the question is, where's it coming from? In addition, we have a whole wave of new regulations that the EPA has issued that's going to impact how we deliver, produce, and deliver power. Coal-fired power plants, which a number of regions of the country rely on pretty substantially for a portion of their portfolio, are either going to have to be retired or they're going to have to be retrofitted, which means they have to go out of service for a substantial period of time. And a lot of money is going to have to be paid to upgrade them to the point where they meet the regulations. Um, and if they're retired, then there's going to have to, something else is going to have to replace them. And the question is, what? At the same time, we're ramping up renewable portfolio standards. This state of California is actually in the vanguard of that with a 33 and a third percent renewable mandate. Um, and that means that you're changing the resource mix in ways that the system was not necessarily designed for. That's going to take new generation. That's going to take new transmission. And because so much of this new generation, um, wind and solar, is what they call intermittent, which means it can't be controlled by the engineers. It happens when it happens, and it doesn't happen when it doesn't happen. So you have to somehow be able to firm that to meet demand at, at the moment of truth, um, the daily, annual, or seasonal peak. So all of this is going to strain the system. 
And all of this is going to require more money, which, you know, anybody who's following the news knows about job killing taxes and, you know, all sorts of anything that requires more money um, is going to be controversial. And add to this the fact that we have a graying workforce in our industry, of which I am exhibit A. <laughs> Um, the literally grade workforce. Um, and, you know, a lot of us are my age. They're baby boomers. We've been in this industry for 30 years, but, you know, we're all hoping for that end point when we can go off and dandle our grandchildren on our knees. Um, and in the meantime, who's coming up behind us? So what we need is a set of newly minted professionals with fresh ideas to enter our industry and help us develop this next set of regulations and solutions. We're going to need help to navigate this transition because it's going to be a tough one, which means there may be a place for you, um, both in our industry at large. And I would hope I've sold you on the idea of thinking about the cooperative or public power segment as, you know, as a, a part of a subpart of the industry that might be attractive to you. Um, and I think with that, I've, entered, I've ended the prepared presentation and I'm ready for your questions. Are you going to moderate these? Keep, keep them all from yes. jumping uh, me? <laughs> sure. I'll per so, uh, questions? I see one over there. Yeah. Um, could you speak to the incentives for incorporating renewables for the munis and the cooperatives, given that, A, a lot of the policy levers like the RPSs and tax credits aren't really applicable, and B, that can be counter to the sort of lowest cost objective sometimes? Yes, I'll be happy to do that. Um, first of all, in many states, we are subject to the RPSs. Um, and I believe in California, the California Energy Commission is the one that ensures our compliance. So yes, in many states, we are subject to them. But even if we aren't, we are units of state and local government. And if you have a state policy, you know we're not necessarily going to ignore that, even in states where um, it's not mandatory. You know, we, we look around, we see what other people are doing, we see where the wind's blowing, and we feel the need to do the same thing. In addition, we have local ownership and local control. Um, just one example, the city of Columbia, Missouri, which is my, the University of Missouri is my alma mater, they have voted in a local referendum for an RPS. So because we are locally controlled, where that's important to the members of the community, we end up doing it. You know, because, because we are, you know, that, that, that bubbles up through city government. Um, so we are. I actually, one of the articles that I think I gave you as a link to our website was about LA's attempt to remake its portfolio, which it is embarked upon right now. And because of this 33 and a third percent, they got to, you know, they got to do a lot in a few years to make that all happen. But there is no question that there's going to be pushback as rates go up, when people get, start getting the bills about how much this is cost, going to cost, I'm quite concerned that there is going to be a pushback. And that necessitates trying to do this in co as cost effective a manner as possible. Um, and to try and eliminate some, what I guess I would call perverse incentives from the system. I'll just give you one example. Right now, wind generators have a production tax credit. Um, and they only get this credit when they produce power. And, this, and this, the credit is a pretty substantial one, which means that even when the price for power in one of these centralized markets is at or near zero, they still want to produce because they need that credit. Um, and that's led to negative pricing in some hours, which is kind of, you know, pay me to take my power, you know, or I'll pay you to take my power. Um, and at the same time, that creates issues for other resources. For example, we have, you know, a nuclear unit is designed to be a baseload unit and to run all the time. Um, and when you ramp it up and down like that, you know, consistently, that can create a lot of operational wear and tear. Same thing for some baseload coal units. So when you have wind that wants to produce, even when the price is negative, you end up taking other units offline that for operational purposes, that may not be a, a good thing in the long run, just from pure engineering standpoint. So, you know, those, one has to question whether those types of incentives are necessarily in the long run, you know, what it's, what it's, what it's you know, now what it's called for is that people are saying, we're not going to continue the PTC, you know, because it's just too crazy. 
So, you know, you have to, and that's why I, I think it's important to have policies that get you where you want to go, but do so in a cost-effective and kind of reasoned time frame. You know, this is what I, you can get more done going down the middle than you necessarily can going from left to right, because if you, you know, I think about, you know, the climate change legislation of a couple years ago that got through the, you know, through the Senate. Boy, everybody felt great about that, but of course it was totally dead on arrival in the House. So what good does that do you? You know, you need to find the way forward that everyone can get on board with, because that's what will stick and will stand the test of time. And it's so hard right now in Washington to find those kinds of policies. It's a really frustrating time on many levels. What you're saying is that you want to have policies that would be able to stick, but it's also the only policies that will stick are ones that, you know, are, are like production and tax credits. That everybody will hate. Is right. that your point? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's no question that's true, but what you have to try and find, and there are, you know, maybe once we get past election year, it'll be possible to do more things. There are people, I mean, when I go up on the Hill and I talk to individual senators and congressmen, there are a lot of people who are A, knowledgeable, and who B, really do want to do the right thing. It's kind of tragic when you think about it. Um, I heard presentation by Lisa Murkowski and Ron Wyden, you know, opposite sides of the aisle, but he's going to be, you know, one of the two of them is either going to be the, 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 the chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate, and the other one's going to be the ranking member next year. And they both say, you know, we like to work together, we have some ideas. And you're like, oh, dear God, you know, could we only get to that point where we could get those kinds of bipartisan things moving forward? This year is just, you know, let's just try to go to sleep till it's over. Um, yes, sir. I, I appreciate your comments on the role that the IPPs play in the North American space. I have a question with regards to career insights and maybe the desire for some of the folks in this community here to take more risk early in their career. and you know, try and maybe push new technology that uh, a less, uh, a more risk averse organization wouldn't necessarily want to deploy. What would you uh, say to us that want to maybe take risk early in our career? Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of startups who right now are trying to work in the demand response and energy efficiency space as well as in renewable generation and distributed generation. I think those are all good places to kind of look. One of my favorite companies is a company called Opower that actually works with utilities, works, has worked with SMUD to try and implement strategies to get customers to pay more attention to their electricity usage. Um, and for example, they've innovated bills where um, if you as a customer, they kind of indicate the size of your house and the type of load that you have. And if your usage is greater than the average, they put a little frowny face on your bill, like, you're a big energy hog. Or, you know, they put a smiley face if you've reduced. And that actually does have motivations for consumer behavior. Sometimes the littlest ideas can have the biggest impact. Um, but those are all, I think, you know, uh, distributed generation and, um, and, you know, the demand response entities who are working to implement demand response. Those are all spaces or, you know, parts of the industry where a young, risk interested guy could go. But I would like to say that, you know, a lot of public power systems are out there too, um, doing a lot of innovative things. Look at Glendale, California. They have done smart meters across their entire system, both water and electric. Um, and they're doing a lot of really innovative things. Um, so at Gainesville, Florida, first net metering tariff for solar in the United States. So don't forget us. Yes, sir. In Texas is a good example, I guess, of where deregulation actually did lead to a lot of people switching retail providers. Uh, well, let me just say, it led to a lot of people switching. I don't necessarily agree. It led to is a good example of deregulation. Right, so could you elaborate on that? Because you mentioned that, you know, that even with a, you know, supposedly well-designed deregulated system like you arguably Texas, that the a nonprofit co-op can do certain things better. Could you be specific about what you see as things that they do better and, you know, specifically around either smart meter rollouts or demand response programs, things that are a little bit more customer facing. Okay. Well, I'm going to be a little careful here because I understand I'm being recorded. So what I'm going to say is there's more than one way to achieve your goals. And if you look at the state of Texas, you'll see that two of the largest systems there are Austin and San Antonio. 
Um, the city of Austin has been in the forefront of um, energy efficiency, demand response, renewables. It's worked with NRDC. It's done a lot of really great stuff. And it's done that, and it can do that, in part because it's still bundled. In other words, it has the ability to go out and contract for resources, be they wind or solar. They have the ability to do that, whereas a system that is purely just delivery, it's up to the customers to all go off and make their own atomized choices, which may work for them, but may not work for the larger system or the greater good of the community. So I think I'll stop there. And if you'd like to come talk to me after, that would be fine, too. Um, are we at uh, witching hour? Or no? Nope? Okay. Yes, sir. What's the difference in effectiveness between the feed-in tariff and the uh, uh, okay. forgetting what the other one's called? Uh, uh, net metering. Net metering. Yes. Um, the feed-in. Well, and actually, there's some legal issues here that I'm not sure a lot of people are necessarily fully familiar with. Um, the feed-in tariff has some issues in terms of FERC jurisdiction for those who are doing the selling um, because it is a sale for resale. And under the Federal Power Act, a sale that's not to an ultimate end user is not a retail sale. So when Joe Blow is selling the power from their solar array back to utility Y, that is technically a sale for resale. Okay? Um, and so one of the things I caution my members is net metering, where you simply, you know, which the difference between that is that you're just basically taking and giving and taking and giving and taking and giving, but there's not necessarily ever a sale. Um, there's just a credit. That jurisdictionally is a little safer, shall we say, but that's just the lawyer in me. Um, you can do a net metering tariff and get out from under FERC if your rate is so, the so-called avoided cost rate under the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act. Um, if it's an avoided cost rate, then, and if you fit the other requirements, you become a qualifying facility and it's not FERC regulated. So let me just say, the short answer is, there's a lot to talk about there, um, a lot of legal ins and outs that um, you, where you have to consider when looking at those two options. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, a lot of the uh, large-scale solar production facilities are way out in the middle of nowhere. Yes. So you mentioned the intermittent uh, generation issue, but you've also got loss of energy because of transmission over long. Yes, losses, is, line losses. Right. So why hasn't why haven't uh, utilities, particularly Local utilities like Palo Alto have uh, been more aggressive in trying to uh, generate. There's a lot of there's a lot of unused roofs are in Palo Alto and, and and parking terraces and all and, and schools and a lot of other facilities. Why haven't they been more aggressive in trying to uh, develop uh, uh, their meet their alternative energy allotment uh, closer to home? Um, I'm not familiar with their plan, so I really can't comment on it in any detail except to say that obviously we're looking at a variety of different ways to do things, um, and some of them involve going together with other, um, other local utilities. A lot of our members are, are members of what they call joint action agencies. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Um, and I believe Palo Alto is a member of the Northern California Power Agency, um, and they are helping their members to implement those, um, you know, to ensure that they are going to meet the renewable standards. So part of it may be the decisions are not all, all made at the Palo Alto level. Some of them may be made by their, their wholesale supplier, the Northern California Power Agency. But I can't speak to, you know, I don't know what programs they're doing, so I really can't speak to that except in the most general way. We do have members who are doing um, solar uh, parking installations. I was up in, in Sacramento a couple weeks ago, and I saw one at a, um, at a shopping center there. So, and I, you know, Governor Schwarzenegger was all about his million roofs um, a couple years ago, but he's gone and, and, and it's expensive to do that. I think you always have to balance the cost of those installations and the, you know, what kind of power you're going to get out of them and what the legal implications of them are um, against, you know, and deciding how best to meet that requirement. 
uh, kind of your legal perspective looking in the future for nuclear energy and the issues surrounding that? Well, that's a great question. Did everybody hear it? It has to do about nuclear. Uh, yeah, he, he was asking about what's the future of nuclear power. That um, obviously, you know, I'd be the great Karnak if I knew the answer to that question. But um, it's going to be interesting to see how. I think a lot of it depends on what happens with the units that the Southern Company and um, South Carolina Gas and Electric are putting in now. There's been four units that have been authorized, and I think the license for the Southern unit the two units that Southern's doing was just issued a week or two ago by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And it uses a standardized design as a Westinghouse, I think AP 1000 design, which has also been approved by the NRC. I think a lot is going to have to do with whether those units come in relatively on budget, on time, how they perform, and in, you know, what their safety record is. If that goes well, and there's no other problems over time, I think you may see more of that. But there's also this whole other trend of thought, which is to do small, more modular nuclear units um, in places, for example, like Alaska, which right now they do diesel fuel. You know? So there's some ideas of using nuclear in innovative ways that have not yet been commercially done. So that's always out there, too. There is no question that the Fukushima um, situation has definitely roiled the waters there. And you know, there are a lot of people who have raised some very legitimate questions about all of that. And then there's the issue of the waste. You know, the Yucca Mountain Repository, which was on track. Once the Democrats it came in, no longer on track. Now there's a blue ribbon task force that has issued recommendations. You know, what's going to happen with that? To me, one of the biggest travesties is people have been collecting, you know, electric utilities were required to collect in their rates nuclear utilities a adder to fund Yucca Mountain. That has been going on for years. That money has gone into the US Treasury and disappeared, just disappeared into the dark of night. And more than one lawsuit has been filed against the Department of Energy saying, you know, where's our waste facility? We've paid for our waste facility. Where is the waste facility? And it's, you know, it's not happening. Now they're trying to introduce legislation to segregate that money so that at least it doesn't go into the federal budget, you know, the US Treasury general budget. But that's where it's been going. So, you know. It's a naughty situation, and I think a lot, and the short answer is a lot has to do with how these four units do over time. Okay. Yes, sir. Are the numbers of um, unis and co-ops growing or shrinking um, or staying the same, and why? Um, interesting you asked that question. Um, it's almost like I always remember the story about, you know, I used to live in a small town in Missouri, and they said the con population of Wisconsin because every time a girl got pregnant, a guy left town. You know, it's a very, very bad joke, I'm sorry. But it's, there's something like akin to public power. Things are happening in both directions. Um, we have some systems that are considering selling to the neighboring IOUs. That happens. Um, there's a system in Florida, Vero Beach, that's considering that right now. On the other hand, there are entities that are municipalities that are considering forming new public power systems. And the one that comes to mind immediately is the city of Boulder, Colorado. Um, they are, have just you know, had a referendum. They've hired counsel. They're investigating condemnation of Excel's facilities to kind of take back their system because they want a, green, a more green system than I think Excel has given them. They want to have more control over what their power supply is. Um, so it works both, we have systems going both ways. So it, 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 it's pretty constant, but underneath that, there's some systems going and some systems coming. So I, I realize that was a flip and politically inappropriate joke, but it kind of does convey the state of affairs. Um, anything else? Yes, sir. A little bit about the dynamics of having, if there were, uh, you know, either a state or national carbon price like there will be in California, how the MPPs will, or you will be uh, negotiating. I mean, obviously, you might be on both sides. I don't know. Um, the question was carbon price. Yeah. Oh, you, you're, you're Actually, we, um, our organization was very interested in the idea of having a carbon tax. Um, and we went in to meet a number of years ago with certain legislators who said, don't let those words utter your lips. Don't pass your lips. We're not doing that. We're doing cap and trade. 
of which we were less enamored because we frankly were concerned that that was a suboptimal system. And as soon as you saw that Morgan Stanley and you know Goldman Sachs and all these guys were lining up for this new market, we started getting concerned because we'd seen what they did in our power markets. Um, and you know, don't get me started on that. But you know, we just were concerned about the market approach. To us, the cleanest approach was just do the tax. We understand what the ramifications are, and then we can act accordingly. Um, but that's, you know, the T word just doesn't seem to be on the table right now. Um, and so EPA regulation is the default. That's, and, and in effect, what they're doing is they're getting to the same place by regulating other um, emissions, you know, the particulates, the mercury, the toxics. You know, but in the end, you'll probably come out at close to the same place. Um, and you know, we understand that's what they're doing. Right behind you. Uh, sort of to the point of the market solution, having some concerns from your perspective, I think the question goes to Professor Wolick. And, uh, yeah, it's about the, time. Come on the, down, the, Frank. The, the theory behind um, competitive wholesale power markets and what we've seen play out in reality, and if there are some advantages, and if a 20% return from an IPP and PJM necessarily means that the cost of delivery is higher, or they could actually have cost improvements that allow them to make greater returns. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I mean, I don't want to take, take away too much of Sue's time, but I think that uh, the United States has a unique challenge uh, relative to the rest of the world, and that, that challenge is the fact that we basically have a federal regulator and state regulator, and we, we have states' rights. Uh, other parts of the world, it's a single regulator, and I think that the, uh, the jury on, uh, on wholesale markets is, is a lot uh, cleaner in the sense that I think uh, for other countries, say Australia, the UK, Spain, uh, a number of these, uh, the Nordic countries, I think that the, the, the general view is that, that it's worked quite well. And I think largely, uh, I think a big problem in the US is, uh, is that there's twofold, is they had a lot more to improve uh, in the sense that they started out as government-owned, vertically integrated monopolies. Uh, we started out as privately owned uh, you know, companies subject to pretty good state-level regulation, as well as I think the, the you know, public power uh, segment as well. So I think part of it is the fact that is the challenges of regulation, uh, as well as I think it's the fact that where we started is, is a very different place from other parts of the world. I, 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 I guess the, the you know, I, I certainly, as an economist, a believer in markets, but I think that uh, that Sue raises a lot of uh, very valid points about things that look. You know, we can't just say there's a market; it's going to be wonderful. Uh, I think there's a very good reason that this industry was regulated for a hundred years. It's an extremely difficult industry to make competitive, simply because. You know, if you wrote down all the characteristics that make uh, markets hard to be competitive, electricity would, would sort of have all those characteristics. And I think a recognition of that in the design of the markets and a recognition of the need to serve consumers uh, in the design of these markets is, is what's necessary to make it happen. So, I mean, I'm ever hopeful, and that's part of the reason I wanted her to come speak, is that I think it's important to see that, you know, that they're, they're sort of uh, both sides of the coin. The only thing I'll add to that is... I wouldn't begrudge a 20% rate of return if I felt that some of that was actually being plowed back in to new investment. But we haven't seen that, at least up until now. Um, and we're reaching a point where we're going to need to have some new investment. So I kind of feel like, I mean, we did this one study that showed that there was $45 billion over the first seven RPM auctions. And I think we got 7,500 megawatts of new capacity for that. That's pretty expensive capacity. Um, Uh, quite a question, but uh, we see certain solar providers uh, providing residential leasing and residential PPA systems. Do you see uh, public power uh, provider organizations expanding on those programs the way SMUD had a lot of solar pioneers back in the 1990s? I don't hear about a lot of those anymore um, as utility owned. Uh, things, but maybe I'm not aware of them. And do you see that happening more either in conjunction with uh, third party financiers who can claim the tax benefits and other things like that? I think a variety, I think SMUD actually is doing a lot on solar now. 
um, as part of their strategy to meet the renewable portfolio standard, but you know, you'd, you would have to check their website or talk to them. We have members who have done solar panels on the municipal garages. We have members who are partnering with grocery stores. Um, you know, we're doing a variety of different things um, and different communities. I am not, you know, I don't know of specific examples where they've chosen to partner with third parties versus do it themselves. I know San Antonio, I think, did a brewery um, the solar, you know, to help with the um, power supply to the brew, one of their large commercial customers, a big brewery in town. So those, those things are happening and taking place. But again, it's locally driven because we're locally owned and locally controlled. Well, uh, we, we're getting to the witching hour, so uh, we, we, why don't we let, let you uh, stop and we'll uh, class dismissed and anybody who has remaining questions can come up and ask Sue. But thanks, thanks very much for speaking to us. And Thank you everyone for the excellent questions. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.